I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. A popular pastor is taking some heat for speaking out against what he's calling cultural hype trains. FaithWire.com's Dan Andros is here right now with more on this. Ed Young is pastor of Fellowship Church in Grapevine, Texas, and he says he has a warning for woke Christians. So what are woke Christians and what was the warning? Yeah, well, woke Christians, while he didn't really give a specific definition, typically refers to Christians who are hopping on the bandwagons of different social justice issues, these issues that become popular hashtags on on Twitter and um, and uh, are identifying with a particular group or movement. And um, Christians are hopping onto these and kind of uh, going along with the cultural and secular world uh, view. So that would be um, just kind of a general quick definition of a woke Christian. And uh, Pastor Young was warning about hopping on, as you mentioned, cultural hype trains. And uh, he said that they're doing so without looking at specifically um, what these movements are tethered to. They're just going along with these hashtags with the bumper sticker, so to speak, and uh, going ahead and going along with it without really doing the research and looking at what is laying underneath and what is really driving uh, these movements. What are some of the cultural issues that uh, he's concerned about? Yeah, well, and as he mentioned, uh, some of them are, you know, relativism, transgenderism, abortion, um, ending the patriarchy and dismantling the uh, the nuclear family structure. These are some of the issues that you'll find if you go underneath the layers of some of these hashtags that are popular on Twitter. And and uh, a lot of times, as Pastor Young mentioned, they'll use these uh, uh, these hashtags to sort of gain popularity because they're general statements that people agree with in general and that wouldn't disagree with, but uh, it's sort of like a Trojan horse to bring in these other issues and, and sort of, uh, you know, pack this agenda, this usually a leftist uh, agenda, and and people, you know, who have goodwill and mean mean to do well and mean to do well to their neighbor, uh, a lot of times unwittingly are championing these other causes that, uh, you know, their faith would actually have them usually stand against. He also uh, addressed the difference between the sentiment Black Lives Matters versus uh, the organization. Yes, he did. And he actually started out and he it was kind of a, he chuckled when he said, you know, I'm probably going to get backlash for this. And, and he ended up being right. Um, but he did start by saying, look, I support the phrase Black Lives Matter. But in addition, so in support of his point uh, that these other issues come in, he said, you got to look at what the organization Black Lives Matter means. So there's a difference there. He can support um, you know, Black Lives Matter as a, as a statement. He absolutely agreed with that. But then when you look at some of the things underneath that this group is pushing, uh, which, which you know, includes some of the aforementioned items, abortion, transgenderism, all these issues that uh, mainline Christians are typically uh, in opposition to, um, he said that those are the things that are, that are lying beneath the surface and that we as Christians uh, can't really adopt and, and have to uh, stand up against. How can Christians navigate showing love and care for people without getting caught up uh, in the cultural mandates of the day? Yeah, it's it's a tough one. And and Pastor Young said that a lot of time a lot of times fear is, is what is gripping uh, people from engaging in these conversations. But he said uh, we all. He also said that we conflate acceptance and approval. And it's it, while we can accept people as Christians, we don't have to approve of their behavior. And so he listed a, a number of things, you know, having you know, gay friends, for example, and saying that he can accept them as friends and, and you know, be with them and, and chat with them and, and have conversation with them. But that doesn't mean we have to approve of their behavior. And so uh, he said that culture has conflated those two things. And so we have to walk carefully understanding that that's the field that we're playing in right here. And so you've got you to be careful, but he always said to lead with kindness and that is the key. What does the Bible say about political correctness? And should a Christian be politically correct? Political correctness is defined as a term that describes language, ideas, policies, and behaviors seen as seeking to minimize social and institutional offense in occupational, gender, racial, cultural, sexual orientation, religious belief, disability, and age-related contexts. The key word here is offense. Certainly as Christians, we are not to go out of our way to offend anyone personally. 
But the truth is, the Christianity itself is offensive, as we read in 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8. 1 Peter 2, 7 and 8. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. As Christians, we need to be diligent and not get caught up in the emotionally charged responses of today's PC culture. We need to chuck our emotions out the window, no matter how hard that may be, and obey God rather than man, as we read in Acts 5.29. But Peter and the apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Equally offensive is the necessity of dying to oneself in order to follow Christ. Of all the religions of the world today, Christianity is the only one that tells you to follow Jesus and die to oneself, as we read in Matthew 16.24 and Galatians 5.24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Those who hear this message know exactly what Jesus means. To follow him is to die to self and give up everything we hold dear. Political correctness in the secular political realm is not the concern of Christians, as our citizenship is in heaven, as we read in Philippians 3.20 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Explosions in several locations in Syria overnight and once again, the finger is pointing at Israel. A Syrian monitoring group saying at least six Israeli missiles were fired at Syrian regime forces and pro-Iranian militias near Damascus, injuring seven troops. The Observatory for Human Rights chief adding that Syrian air defenses did not intercept a single target. This is the first airstrike allegedly launched in Syria since June, when nine Iran-backed fighters were killed. Meantime, in Iran, the mysterious string of fires, explosions, and other such supposed accidents is continuing. The latest incidents, a massive factory fire in the northern Tabriz, and a transformer explosion at a power station in central Iran's Ifsahan. These are the latest in a string of at least 15 fires or explosions or leaks at sensitive Iranian sites in less than a month, several being blamed on alleged Israeli and American sabotage. Iran for its part launching a campaign to show strength and change the narrative, highlighting recent fires across the United States in an attempt to demonstrate some sort of link. Whenever I hear that Damascus has been bombed, it reminds me of a prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled, spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, and seems to be on the verge of coming to pass. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14, The Burden Against Damascus Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17, 9 in that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. 
Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. Whether it's the exploding coronavirus, mysterious fires at nuclear and military facilities, or protests, Iran's ruling Islamic clerics are facing unprecedented challenges as the regime tries to maintain an iron grip on the nation. On Monday, the government executed a man it convicted of spying for the CIA and Israeli intelligence. Mahmoud Musavi Majid received that sentence for allegedly passing information to the CIA about the whereabouts of General Qassam Soleimani. The powerful leader was killed in a U.S. drone strike earlier this year. This is a regime that's facing really uh, a possible rebellion in the near future. Regime officials talk about it, and so they're executing a lot of people to put fear into the public. The execution follows a string of mysterious fires and explosions around the country. On Sunday, fires broke out at a military installation near Tehran, a shipyard in Boucher, and a key power plant connected to Iran's Natanz nuclear facility in Isfahan. Similar incidents have happened across Iran since June. This cannot be a coincidence. This cannot be uh, just uh, a series of, of accidents that without malicious intent from someone. Some pointing to Israel's ongoing overt and at times covert war against the Islamic Republic. Israel specifically is trying to stop the transfer of very advanced, precise munitions to the regime's proxies like Hezbollah, and also wants to slow down the Iranian nuclear program. This, as President Trump reportedly gives the CIA green light to launch more offensive cyber attacks to cripple or destroy some of Iran's critical infrastructures. As we continue to watch Bible prophecy unfold, it seems as though the war of Gog and Magog is looming on the horizon. Ezekiel 38, 1 through 9. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that many people believe will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. As we can see by recent events, Stage setting for the War of Gog and Magog is taking place as Russia, Iran, and Turkey are forming a dangerous alliance at the doorstep of Israel's border. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, 
and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, 9 For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog, that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator, whose fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East, biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. John 15, 18 through 20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. All this against the backdrop of ongoing government protests and a remarkable revival that's witnessing thousands of Muslims turning to Christianity in the midst of COVID-19. That's why we call this a pandemic of hope. Mike Ansari runs Mohabbat TV, one of the most popular Christian satellite channels in Iran. The ministry reports it is recording 10 times more online salvations than this time last year. We're registering around 3,000 professional decisions, personal decisions by Iranian Muslims to leave Islam for Christianity during this revival. Ansari says that's 3,000 people each month who've decided to follow Jesus Christ since the pandemic began in March. People in Iran are just not happy the way uh, their economy is going, the way uh, the government is uh, robbing them uh, of their natural resources and exporting Shiite Islam to the neighboring countries. Um, so they just don't trust their government. The large number of people leaving Islam is causing a backlash against the church. Dozens of Christians have also been arrested and imprisoned for responding to the gospel message since March. During these critical times for the regime, uh, there's a tendency historically for the regime to really crack down on religious uh, communities like Christian commerce, and we see that today. Iran is one of the world's most dangerous places for Christians, yet Christianity is growing faster in Iran than in any other country in the world. Jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Christians would be persecuted as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and Luke 21, 12. Matthew 24, 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Luke 21, 12, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Here to talk more about what's going on in China's uh, church crackdown is senior international correspondent Gary Lane. Gary, uh, Christians say it is the worst persecution that they have seen since uh, Mao Zedong's cultural revolution. Tell us, uh, when did this latest wave of persecution begin? Well, of course, it didn't start with COVID-19, as you know. Yeah. That's just the excuse now, as we mentioned. 
But George, this started back in 2015, and if you recall, I know you reported about it, I did too, the removal of crosses from atop churches, mostly in Xinjiang province. Uh, hundreds of them were removed, and then uh, raids on churches. And you know, back in 2018, you reported this, Wang Yi. Wang Yi was the head pastor of the Early Rain Covenant Church. Uh, on December 9th, 2018, he was arrested, and along with about 100 members of his church, the leadership there, most of them have been released now, but he received nine years in prison uh, simply for leading an unregistered church. Uh, the church was growing, and that's what the, uh, the communists were worried about. Uh, but we still don't know where he is or what's happened to him. That's yeah. recent examples. You talked about the crosses, but can you talk about more recent examples uh, of, uh, of, of this latest uh, crackdown against Christians? Well, we mentioned the two churches in Zhejiang province. Uh, we had two of them on July 7th. Uh, where crosses were removed from the top of their buildings. The Christians come out to protest. They get beaten. And an 80-year-old man, George, was violently shoved to the ground, an 80-year-old man. Also on July 5th, raids of another church in Guilin. And uh, some of the believers there stood out in front of the uh, Public Security Bureau office and start, started singing hymns yeah. as they awaited the release of some of their leaders. But this is ongoing. Yeah. And you talk about some of these individuals. Are they actually being arrested and charged and sentenced to prison for a certain uh, period well, of time? Well, they're charged. Yeah. Now, whether they're sentenced to prison, they have to wait until their trial. But uh, what, what is happening, George, this is all part of sinicization, mm. which is, uh, in other words, it is China saying this is a new policy whereby to be a good citizen of China, you must be uh, faithful. You must show fidelity to the Communist Party and to our leaders, to our nation. You do that by putting up posters or portraits of the, uh, our leaders. Here's a church mm -hmm. where you don't see a cross there, but you see Mao and next to him is Xi Jinping, the president for life. No cross in that church. Also on the sides of the churches, uh, things like propaganda uh, posters uh, and sayings, rather than quotes from Jesus in the Bible. And this is happening to individuals in their homes as well. Uh, obviously very familiar to what's, uh, you know, similar to what's happening in North Korea. Yes. You know, with the leaders of the Kim dynasty and so forth. Almost like a cult following. Exactly. I I'm curious, what can we in the United States do? What can the president of the United States do? There is the International Religious Freedom Act, which uh, grants the president and members of Congress the authority to enact legislation that would punish individuals who violate human rights. Beyond that, George, I would say pray. Mm -hmm. We as believers need to pray for the Christians like Pastor Wang Yi, nobody knows where he is. He's suffering in prison. Also, uh, pray for revival in China. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3, 1 Corinthians 12.26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Matthew 5.10-12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecute the prophets who were before you. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Serious charges against a St. Louis couple who say they were just defending themselves when they displayed their weapons as protesters marched past their home last month. It happened shortly after the George Floyd killing in Minneapolis ignited that firestorm of racial unrest throughout the country. You remember these pictures, these images. We've seen the couple. Now they're being charged. Chief Breaking News correspondent Trace Gallagher has the breaking details tonight. Good evening, Trace. Brett, good evening, Mark and Patricia McCloskey, who on June 5th confronted those St. Louis protesters, have now been charged with unlawful use of a weapon. The couple, both of whom are lawyers, have not been arrested, but will soon be given a notice to appear in court. St. Louis Circuit Attorney Kimberly M. Gardner wrote in part, quoting here, Today my office filed charges against Mark and Patricia McCloskey following an incident involving peaceful, unarmed protesters on June 28th. It is illegal to wave weapons in a threatening manner at those participating participating in nonviolent protest and while we are fortunate this situation did not escalate into deadly force 
This type of conduct is unacceptable in St. Louis. Gardner said she decided on charges after a thorough investigation by the St. Louis police, but police also reportedly found the weapons were not loaded and that Mrs. McCloskey's gun wasn't even real. An attorney for the couple said the charges are, quote, disheartening, as I unequivocally believe no crime was committed. And Missouri Governor Mike Parsons had said that if charges against the couple were filed, he was prepared to exercise his pardon powers. The governor went on to say even without a pardon, the couple would likely not be doing any jail time. And the prosecutor today appeared to back that up claim. She says that, that she believes the best course of action here is for the McCloskeys to participate in a diversion program, which is kind of designed to keep them out of the court system. So far, we have not heard directly from the McCloskeys themselves. Isaiah 520, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Federal officers in Portland, Oregon, fired tear gas and smoke bombs in new clashes with protesters. In recent days, agents have taken several people away in unmarked vehicles, allegedly without legal cause. President Trump is vowing to send federal agents to more cities just over 100 days before the election. Carter Evans has more from Portland. As the crowd rushed toward the courthouse here in Portland, officers responded with tear gas again. <laughs> President Trump says more federal agents could soon be coming to other cities. We're looking at Chicago, too. We're looking at New York. Look at what's going on. All run by Democrats. A Department of Homeland Security memo obtained by CBS News shows the agency preparing to deploy officers to a number of cities, which could include Kansas City and Albuquerque. But first up is Chicago, where they'll send 175 agents. And I'll be darned if I'm going to let anybody, even if their name is Mr. President, bring those kind of uh, troops to our city. DHS Acting Secretary Ken Cuccinelli is defending the actions of federal officers in Portland. We're accomplishing our mission, which is to protect the federal facilities and the people in them and using them. Sharon Myron, who is also a county commissioner in Oregon, says she was tear gassed while attending the protest after a shift in the ER. I think the tear gas is doing exactly the opposite of what they would like to accomplish. So it didn't deter you? It didn't deter me. It made, deter me. It made me, in fact, want to go back. The United States is divided on just about every issue. Race, gay marriage, transgenderism abortion, and the list goes on. Jesus said that a kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation as we read in Matthew 12, 25. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. My question is this, with everything that is happening in the US right now, are we witnessing the desolation of America? One day Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved.
God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.